this guy here. It's Viktor Shklovsky, a Russian literary scholar. As you can see, he really loved to argue. And if arguing about literature seems tame to you, think again. He had a really exciting life. He was a notorious rebel and a published poet by the age of 15. He uh, was a revolutionary and then a counter-revolutionary. He faked insanity and fought in a duel. He was the instructor of an armored car division and professor of literature. He was friends or enemies, or both, with all the interesting people of his time, like with um, the poet Mayakovsky there in these very charming bathing suits. Um, he had very complicated relationships with brilliant women, and he lived to be 91. So what is the most important thing to happen to him in this long life? It was reading Tolstoy. And not even one of the great novels. It was reading a diary entry about a day on which nothing happened whatsoever. This is how it goes. I was dusting in the room. Having come full circle, I approached the sofa, and I didn't remember if I had dusted it off or not. That's it. That's the end of story. Tolstoy did a bit of dusting. And then he goes on to say, I didn't remember it because these movements are routine, unconscious. And if the whole life of a person is lived unconsciously, it is as if this life had never been. And Shklovsky reads this as a young man and is deeply struck. So in 1917, in between all his um, revolutionary activities, he uh, gives a talk at a literary cafe. He quotes Tolstoy, and he says, this is how life becomes nothing and disappears. Automatization eats up things, furniture, clothes, your wife, and the fear of war. And he also finds a medicine against automatization. To him, it's art. And when he says art, he mostly means literature. He says, what we call art exists in order to give back the sensation of life in order to make us feel things, in order to make the stone stony. And he spent the rest of his life studying how literature makes life more real. And he finds that it does so by presenting usual things in unusual ways, by describing usual things with unusual words, often from a naive perspective. Like um, if you read the phrase, and then his body stopped moving, and they put it into a wooden box. You have to reconstruct the meaning bottom up, and this makes this description of death more visceral. This example is by Tolstoy, as are most examples Shklovsky discusses, and very strikingly, most examples are socially critical, like um, how would a horse uh, describe the institution of property? Shklovsky says this is Tolstoy's way to reach conscience. And this is the main difference between Shklovsky and the romantics before him. Because in the 19th century, romantic poets also said that the goal of literature is to make the usual astonishing. Shelley and Coleridge said that poetry must lift the whale from the hidden beauty of the world and um, awaken the mind's attention from the lethargy of custom. And this is the same goal, in a way, like when you stop noticing flowers, and then you read a striking poem about a flower, and suddenly you appreciate, you appreciate the real thing again. But Shklovsky's focus is different. Remember, he said, automatization eats up the fear of war. He lived in times of great violence. He fought in two wars, and what terrified him most was the lack of terror in himself and in others. He saw soldiers sitting on corpses, enjoying their lunch. He saw uh, people discussing uh, the number of dead as if it were uh, sports statistics. Um, and he believed that literature could shake people awake. He only wrote about Russian literature, but the phenomenon is universal. Uh, for instance, um, Jonathan Swift um, is just as fond as um, 
giving a voice to horses, as Tolstoy. In his Gulliver's Travels, there are these uh, sapient horses called Huino, who are very intelligent, but have no idea about human society. So they ask questions like, why do countries go to war? And because they have no concept of religion, uh, Gulliver has to explain it like this. Sometimes difference in opinion costs millions of lives. For instance, whether flesh be bread or bread be flesh, or whether the juice of a certain berry be blood or wine. And if you put it like that, rather than saying it's um, a conflict between Catholics and Protestants, it sounds utterly absurd, right? So imagine reading this in the 18th century and maybe even asking yourself if it's really such a great idea to kill people in the name of faith. So I was as struck by reading Shklovsky as he had been by reading Tolstoy. And soon I noticed something very much like what he describes happening outside of literature. For instance, um, Benjamin Rush um, is not a novelist, but a founding father and um, one of the fathers of American psychiatry. And he wrote an article called um, The Need for a Peace Office of the United States. And he begins quite soberly. He describes why um, they need a peace office. And then he suggests renaming the existing war office. And he lists a few options, like an office for butchering the human species, a widow and orphan making office, a broken bone making office, and so on. It's a very long list. Um, and it's very much like um, they put his body in a wooden box. It's um, words that are, well, applicable, but that are not usually used in this context. Um, in this case, words that are not usually appropriate for um, naming state departments. Um, and as for talking horses, they too have their analogs in political speeches. In 1966, for instance, Martin Luther King imagined a UFO landing in America. And he thought the aliens would have a rather bleak impression of us. He said, they would see that we spend billions on creating engines and strategies for war and that we spend millions on fighting death by disease and other causes. So our visitors from outer space might be excused if they came to the conclusion that our planet is inhabited by the insane. Uh, um, and um, these horses and aliens, uh, well, we don't know what they would really think, right? Um, they are just a vehicle for thought experiments here. They are very convenient to help us imagine what something very different might think. Another kind of thought experiment works like this. You take a familiar fact and then you compare it to a different situation. For instance, if you live in the West, chances are you have enough money to save the life of a child. If you donate effectively, it costs about a few thousand euro. Um, and now imagine a scenario um, developed by the philosopher Peter Singer. You are walking past that shallow pond, and there is a splash, and you see a drowning child. And you can easily wade in and save the child. Would you do it? And, yeah, right, of course you would, right? And then imagine that you are wearing a very expensive suit and very expensive shoes, and let's say no dry cleaner will be able to restore them, and there is no time to undress would you still save the child? And that's a question only a Martian would ask, right? Of course you would, what the difference? And now back to our familiar situation, if you have the means to save the life of a child, and if you would not hesitate to do so if the child was right in front of you, are things that different if the child is in another country? Barack Obama said, that human progress is driven by looking at things with new eyes. He was talking to a group of young people, and he said that young people are especially good at this. When you get older, he said, you get in the habit of seeing the same thing, and it becomes routine to you, normal. But when you are young, you ask, why does it have to be this way? 
why does our community have to be poor? Why do we have to discriminate um, against a minority group in our country? And he was talking to students, so um, he was flattering them a bit, saying that their fresh eyes are the future. But actually, you don't have to be young in order to reimagine yourself and the world, in order to see familiar things afresh. And this seeing the familiar afresh is what I call newing. It's in the context of activism that I first started noticing it outside of literature. But actually, I think you can find it in many walks of life. You can find it in science and invention, and you know, the scientist's famous um, childish sense of wonder. You can find it in education and innovation of all kinds. Um, the best teachers do it, and the best TED talkers. I think it can help find new solutions in almost any job. And apart from questions and solutions, Newing can also provide pleasure. Uh, you know, with COVID, we all had the experience of um, newly appreciating uh, habitual pleasure, like um, having people over or smelling coffee again. But you don't have to actually forego a pleasure in order to feel it again. You don't have to lose something in order to become aware of it. Um, sharing an experience can do the trick. Try walking down a familiar street with another person, preferably someone from a very different place, and try looking at things with their eyes. And maybe you'll see everything again, every house and every tree. Or next time you eat a banana, imagine you are doing so for the first time. I mean, it's such a weird thing, right? Is it the shape and uh, the intense color? And the taste, how would you even describe it to someone who never had a banana? It's so difficult to come up with something more precise than um, sweet, right? So maybe we are just missing the birds for the taste of a banana. And I think we are also missing a word for this thing I'm talking about, for reconsidering or re-experiencing the familiar with a sense of wonder, hence newing. I really think we need this word because we need this concept. Uh, and we need research on newing. There are so many books out there on um, questioning the status quo and on um, lateral thinking and on appreciation and awareness, but there doesn't seem to be a concept bringing it all together which is why I'm now trying to collect material for a book on Newing. And if you have any stories for me from your life or work uh, or anything, they're very, very welcome. But above all, I really want you to try it out at home. You can do your own Newing. You can make friends with imaginary aliens or horses, or you can make friends with real people who are different from you. You can come up with thought experiments. You can um, explore familiar surroundings with new people. You can uh, try to find out what your world seems like to others. Uh, you can try newing as a means of questioning. Like next time you read a newspaper, discuss it with an alien. Or you know, ask yourself what is normal for you, but what might, what might be shocking to your great-grandchildren. Try newing as um, a work tool, no matter what you do, especially if you're stuck. Try imagining what someone might suggest if they had no idea about your field or problem. Or actually ask someone who has no idea, even better. Um, try newing um, as a means of not taking things for granted. I'm really sorry if you hate bananas. I'm just stuck with this example now. So next time you eat a banana, Really imagine you're doing it for the first time. And imagine peeling it open for the first time. Try to really appreciate the smell and the texture and the taste. Uh, you know, I, I've always been skeptical about the phrase, live every day as if it was your last. To me, it suggests um, apprehension rather than appreciation. I mean, 
if I knew today was my last chance to eat a banana. Uh, I'd have a certain wistful feeling, yes, but I'd much prefer a fresh and shiny sense of joy. I'd much rather live every day as if it was my first. Thank you. Thank you so much.